Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to our neurotheology lecture series. So in the last lecture, we had stopped at the notion that running the spirituality program has effects above and beyond itself, effects on our mental and physical health. And now we'd like to try to explore those effects in a bit more detail. Uh, and let us use as our springboard this uh, broad review paper titled Religion, Spirituality, and Health, the Research and Clinical Implications. And what a review paper does is that the author searches the medical literature, looks at hundreds or thousands of papers, and categorizes them and summarizes them. So it's basically an executive summary of the medical literature. And we will see that religion and spirituality has profound effects on mental health, on behavior, and on physical health, and in fact, very positive effects. So I will abstract directly from the paper using the paper's headings, and I'm going to jump right into section four of the paper, Religion, Spirituality, and Mental Health. And in section 4.1, the author looks at the medical literature regarding coping with adversity and religion and spirituality. And so, for example, we note that between 2000 and 2010, 344 studies were published in the medical literature, and that the overwhelming majority of these studies showed that people were reporting that religion and spirituality was helpful to them in coping with adversity. And so this reflects, of course, things like uh, verse 153 in Surah Al-Baqarah, O you who have attained to faith, seek aid in steadfast patience and prayer, for behold, God is with those who are patient in adversity. So a point that I'll be stressing over and over is that when we run into these verses in the Quran, we now need to think of them not as just general spiritual verses, but also as specific scientific verses. And we are now beginning to uh, uncover, just beginning, but beginning to uncover some of the scientific neurophysiologic basis uh, behind this. So section 4.2.1, well-being and happiness. And so by mid-2010, at least 326 quantitative peer-reviewed studies had examined the relationship of well-being and happiness to religion and spirituality. Now, I want to pause for a minute at this quantitative and peer-reviewed. What does this mean? It means that these are studies that had quantitative scales, so they could compare one thing to another. They had a precise scientific methodology, and they were peer-reviewed. That means that they were reviewed by experts in the field who deemed them worthy of publication. So this is not just someone sitting with vague notions, uh, you know, writing their opinions. These are scientific studies that are coming to definitive conclusions. And of those, 79% found only significant positive associations between religion and spirituality and well-being. So, the vast majority found positive associations and only significant positive associations, no negative associations at all between religion and spirituality and well being and happiness. And this doesn't mean that 21% found the opposite. In fact, only three studies, less than 1%, reported a significant inverse relationship between religion and spirituality and the sense of well being and happiness. So the vast majority of studies find that religion and spirituality very significantly promote well-being and happiness. Now, we may take that for granted because we're religious people, but I want us to take a step back and think about the implications of this, because there is a logical argument that can be made to the contrary. And in fact, the new atheist movement is very busy trying to make that argument. Um, what is that argument? Well, let's look at this bus ad that the new atheist movement is taking out on buses in Europe. There's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. So they are saying that since there is no God, you can stop worrying and you can enjoy your life. And that is precisely 
that logical argument that when we are religious, well, number one, we have a lot of religious obligations. We, we pray five times a day. We fast, we pay zakat. We restrain ourselves from uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of things that may be uh, pleasurable uh, because they're haram. We uh, are feeling guilty when we don't measure up to these standards and when we commit sins. We are worried about our fate in the afterlife. Are we going to go to hell? We have a sense that God is always watching us, everything that we do. That's a lot to carry. Who would uh, be expected to be happier? Somebody who's carrying that sort of load or someone who is, for example, an atheist and a hedonist. They have no particular moral code. They have no concern about the afterlife. They have no belief in God. And if they choose to adhere to no moral code, they can just live for their pleasure. Well, the new atheist movement is very busy making the logical argument that that second group would be much happier than people, quote unquote, burdened by religion. But it turns out that precisely the opposite is true. Religion and spirituality, instead of imposing a burden, and instead of imposing a worry and an, and an anxiety, very significantly promote happiness and well-being. So then how does that happen? Well, we are now beginning to understand the neurophysiologic basis. To put it succinctly, the God who revealed uh, this religion is the same God who created our brains. And out of mercy, our brains work in a very particular way that when we follow religion and spirituality, we actually end up happier and end up feeling more secure and end up with a better sense of well-being. And so this is from, uh, this is your brain on prayer and meditation from NBCnews.com saying that there's research backing the idea that meditation and prayer can trigger the release of feel-good chemicals in the brain. Um, one of those we've seen is dopamine. Another is oxytocin. Dr. Loretta Breuning explains that when we pray, we release hormones like oxytocin. Now, oxytocin, you may know uh, in the setting of labor and delivery in a pregnant woman and lactation, promoting the milk and secretion and so forth, but it also has uh, psychological effects. It promotes trust and it promotes comfort and attachment. And so, the, uh, her idea is that the release of oxytocin in prayer gives a sense of, quote, I can count on something to protect me at a time when I might be feeling helpless, like when you were a baby. And pr prayer can provide uh, a, a source of hope and a source of well being. And one of the foundations is the release of oxytocin. Another foundation, of course, is the release of dopamine. And so, uh, we see then that when the Quran makes statements with verses like verse four on Surah Al-Fatiha, I'll just read the beginning portion of the verse. It is he for who from on high has bestowed inner peace upon the hearts of the believers so that they increase faith upon their faith. And uh, verse 28 from Surah Ta'at, Surah 13, Those who believe and whose hearts find comfort in the remembrance of Allah, surely in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find comfort. So we begin to see then that these are not just vague, general, spiritual, uplifting sorts of, of verses. They are, of course, spiritual. They are, of course, uplifting. But we begin to see that they are also specifically scientific verses that address neurophysiology and how our brains have been designed to work. That prayer does promote a sense of peace and well-being, that it does promote comfort in the heart, that it does promote serenity. And we now are beginning to understand the neurophysiology and the neurochemicals that actually make this happen. And now I won't cover the whole paper, but when we look at multiple parameters, sense of hope, sense of optimism, a sense of meaning and purpose, a sense of self-esteem, a sense of control, positive character traits like altruism, volunteerism, kindness, compassion, forgiveness, each of these has its own section in this review paper. 
And the evidence, the scientific evidence, is overwhelming that religion and spirituality has a very positive correlation with all of these uh, positive character traits. Now let's look at the flip side, negative traits or negative issues like mental health problems. Now depression is a very, very significant mental health issue and a very widespread one. And very interestingly, 63% of the peer reviewed trials found that religion and spirituality produced better outcomes in depression than either standard treatments or controls. Now, this is very profound. And by the way, it doesn't mean that 37% found the opposite. No. The rest found perhaps no strong correlation, and only two studies, 7%, found that standard treatments were superior to religion and spiritual interventions. So we're not saying religion and spirituality versus doing nothing. We're comparing religion and spirituality to the broad array of standard medical therapies for depression, from psychotherapy and talk therapy to electroshock therapy at an opposite extreme, to the middle ground of medical therapy with the numerous classes of medications aimed at combating depression like tricyclic antidepressants, like serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like monoamine oxidase uh, inhibitors. So compared to the armamentarium of medical therapies, it turns out that religion and spirituality is better in the majority of papers at combating and treating and helping depression. Let's look at anxiety. So Again, another very debilitating and very wide uh, problem in the population, very broad-based problem. 78% of the paper, seven out of nine experimental studies, found that religion and spirituality had a strongly positive impact on helping anxiety. And 69% reported that, 69% of the papers reported that religion and spirituality reduced anxiety more than standard medical therapies. Once again, comparing this to standard therapies, religion and spirituality is better. And only one study found an increase in anxiety following religious and spiritual interventions. And so the, when the Quran comes to tell us in Surah Fussilat, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم, إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ألا تخافوا ولا تحسن. Surely those who say our Lord is Allah and then remain steadfast, the angels descend upon them saying, do not fear, do not grieve. That religion and spirituality has the result of the angels descending upon people telling them, do not fear, that is combating anxiety, and do not grieve, that is combating depression. So we need to once again understand that these verses are Astaghfirullah, certainly not empty sloganistic or feel good statements. And we need to see them as even something beyond broad based general uplifting spiritual statements. They are also very, very specific scientific statements. And we are now beginning to understand the neurophysiologic and neurochemical basis behind these statements. Now, when we look at social problems and behavior, we find that, of course, as expected, religion and spirituality has a very significant deterrent effect on delinquency and crime. And there's a, an inverse relationship between religion and spirituality and delinquency and crime. That's expected. So I, I don't think that's particularly illuminating. But one thing of particular interest is that 100% of 10 studies between 2000 and 2009 that looked at grades and school performance in adolescents and college students found that religion and spirituality helped you do better in school. Religious and spiritual youth did better than less religious youth in each and every single study that looked at this correlation. So when the Quran comes and tells us, Recite what has been revealed to you of the book and establish the prayer. Indeed, the prayer prevents from the immorality and evil deeds, and surely the remembrance of Allah is the greatest. Allah knows what you do. Surah Al-Ankabut, verse 45. 
indeed, we again see that now quantitative scientific literature is showing us that yes, indeed, it is precisely as the verse is saying. And when we look at the opposite, those who do not indulge in their prayer and their spirituality. Yet they were succeeded by generations of people who lost all thought of prayer and followed but their own lusts. And these will in time meet with utter disillusion. Surat Maryam. Now let's look at another big social problem, marital instability. What we find that 79 studies in the medical literature examine the relationships between marital stability and religion and spirituality. 86% found religion and spirituality related to greater marital stability. And no studies reported a negative association between religion and spirituality and marital stability. So that is profound. And again, reflecting Surah al Rum, verse 21. And of his signs is that he created for you from yourself spouses that you may find tranquility in them. And he placed between you affection and mercy. Indeed, in that are signs for people who give thought. So if we internalize this verse, that our spouses are a blessing from God, so that we may find tranquility in them and that he has placed between our hearts affection and mercy. Well, if we internalize that, of course, the result is going to be greater marital stability. And in a society like ours with a very, very high divorce rate, a, a high rate of marital dissatisfaction and unhappiness, even among those who are not divorced, this is profoundly important. And again, we go back to oxytocin, which promotes a sense of attachment, a sense of trust. And we see that when this is secreted because of prayer, because of running the spirituality program in the brain, perhaps, and God knows best, these feelings are part of that uh, general effect that running the program has upon our brain. So, Basically, science is finding, and again, from NBC News, the power of prayer. What happens to your brain when you pray? And this is Dr. Newberg, who we've heard more, uh, we've heard uh, from him or about him uh, already previously, that prayer has definitive power uh, to affect the mind, the body, the spirit, and so forth. And so Dr. Newberg is saying, we see not only changes in the activity levels, but in different neurotransmitters, the chemicals in our brain. So prayer affects uh, the levels and secretion of a variety of neurotransmitters. And because the brain also controls basic body functions like heart rate, blood pressure, immune system, there's evidence to show that by doing these practices, you can cause a lot of different changes all the way throughout the body, which could have a healing effect. So basically, this slide is my transition now to the physical effects of prayer. We've talked about uh, psychological positive effects. We've talked about behavioral positive effects, like delinquency, like marital instability. Now, let us talk about the positive physical effects on physical health of prayer. So this is covered in section seven of our review paper, Religion, Spirituality, and Physical Health. So when we look at things like coronary heart disease, you know, we talk about cholesterol, we talk about blood pressure, we talk about, you know, how exercise will, will help us uh, with heart disease. But it turns out that 63% of the medical uh, papers examined showed a significant inverse relationship between religion and spirituality and heart disease. What does an inverse relationship mean? It means that the more religious and spiritual you are, the less coronary artery disease you have. And uh, there have been multiple studies that looked at cardiovascular reactivity, heart rate variability, and outcomes following cardiac surgery. All of these things, having variable heart rate is good. When your heart rate varies between rest and exercise, that's good. Having a reactive cardiovascular system is good. Outcomes following cardiac surgery is good. So 
69% of the studies report that religion and spirituality was significantly related to positive cardiovascular functions or outcomes and to lower levels of inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein and fibrinogen that put individuals at risk for cardiovascular disease. And these are independent positive effects. So uh, one may have guessed that uh, controlling obesity uh, would be helpful against heart disease. One may have guessed that exercise or watching your diet or lowering your cholesterol. But would we have guessed that there is a hard scientific basis that religion and spirituality actually improves the health of your coronary arteries? Well, the, the uh, scientific evidence is, is pretty compelling. Immune function. So uh, looking at the effect of religion and spirituality on your immunity. We find that cellular immunity is better, lower levels of anti-inflammatory cytokines. There are very significant positive associations between religion and spirituality and our immune system. And in fact, there have been studies, for example, that looked at HIV patients uh, and looked at viral levels. And these are patients already infected with HIV. Religious spiritual patients had lower viral counts. That's a fairly stunning result. And no high quality study found only an inverse association or negative effects. One study reported mixed findings. So the vast majority of studies are showing that religion and spirituality boosts immunity. Let's look at cancer. Uh, 12 studies of 20, 60% found a positive association between religion and spirituality and both cancer risk and outcomes if one were to get cancer. And very interestingly, no study reported a worse risk or worse outcome. So again, when we say 60% found positive results, it doesn't mean 40% found negative results because 60% found positive results, 40% did not find significant positive results. Not one single study in the literature reports worsened risk or worsened outcome between religion and spirituality and cancer. So that's compelling that uh, these very uh, hard biological diseases uh, that, that you know, can have a behavioral basis or a genetic basis or a random basis, um, we find that religion and spirituality both lowers the risk of getting the disease and improves the outcome if God forbid we do get the disease. And we look at now the bottom line from all of these, mortality. We're saying that the most impressive research on the relationship between religion and spirituality and physical health is in the area of mortality. And when you look at 63 methodologically most rigorous studies, 75% found that religion and spirituality predicted greater longevity. And only 5% reported shorter longevity. Uh, and so I'll let you read the bottom paragraph uh, by, by yourself, but um, that again is another fairly stunning result, that religion and spirituality, we've seen sort of specifics in terms of heart disease, in terms of blood pressure, in terms of cancer. When we look at overall mortality, religion and spirituality promote longevity. Uh, the, the effects on physical health are profound. and um, the, the effects here uh, have been rated to be as high as lowering cholesterol by cholesterol lowering drugs or exercise based rehabilitation after heart attack. And these are first line medical therapies. So that means that there is quite a profound effect of religion and spirituality on physical health. And so the bottom line again, from an article called Your Brain on Prayer. Prayer is incredibly good for you. And so just to quote directly from the article, forms of prayer have been linked to psychological and biological changes for greater health. Regular prayer reduces blood pressure, heart rate improves the heart synchronization with the breathing. It alters hormones like melatonin, like serotonin. We've already seen dopamine. We've seen oxytocin. The immune system gets a boost. Disease states are improved. 
pain and anxiety is blunted, positive moods are higher. And so, and these are studies comparing not prayer and spirituality to doing nothing. It's comparing religion and spirituality to secular meditation. Prayer undeniably comes out on top. And the emphasis is in this article, not, this is not my underlining and my emphasis. So profound, profound positive effects. And so um, these are the effects of running that religion and spirituality program that our earlier lectures, I hope, have provided convincing evidence are embedded in us. So I hope that you found this interesting and instructive. And please join us then for the next and last lecture in our neurotheology series. Um, assalamu alaikum and God bless.